Thank you very much. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here at the ICTP, where for me, over the years, much mathematics has, uh, has happened. And uh, Jason uh, yesterday gave an absolutely splendid lecture, uh, provoked by a question I asked him in 2009 when we were here in this very room. Uh, but anyway, uh, enough reminiscing. Let me see if I can actually make this move. Um, so I want to just share with you a couple of small ideas and observations uh, that we've developed or come up with over the last few years. This is, let's see if this will work. Yes, joint work with Eleni Panayotu who unfortunately can't be with us. She's busy teaching hordes of students mathematics in Santa Barbara. Uh, we, became, we started working on uh, sort of nodding and linking and entanglement in um, polymer gels uh, some years ago. And in one of those, in, in the principal model or for simulation, of course, one uses periodic boundary conditions. Uh, and so I'm just going to focus on one dimensional, namely one degree of periodicity. Uh, so in fact, in those settings, I think of them as being sort of a long tube. Here, I've drawn it where the cell is actually like a cube. But in other situations, I like to think of it as like a, a round tube with a disk cross-section. Right? The mathematics is roughly the same. The simulation is similar. But, and this example, or this setting, I think is maybe a little bit nicer, a little more natural. So when I think of a tube, though, um, the tube could be something with a square cross-section or could have a disk cross-section. Uh, Olympic systems are those that um, consist of uh, ring polymers inside, or rings. Uh, Yunnan, is Yunnan here someplace? Yeah. Uh, wasn't it you and Javier Asuaga had some papers on um, like Olympic systems, mitochondria? Yes. OK, good. The memory is still working. OK. So. Um, I was reading one of these papers, and a student came into my office, a uh, very bright student, and needed a project. And so I was looking at your paper, and I said, oh, OK, let's, uh, let's look at systems of this character employing the methods that Eleni and I had developed. And so uh, I'm going to tell you about the work with Spencer Egram, who's now starting a doctoral program at the University of of uh, Indiana. So, OK. Uh, so the context is these uh, tubes. And the content, they're going to contain either, uh, let's see here, I'm still struggling, filaments, that is open chains, or cir closed circular chains, OK? And we're, they're going to be periodic, OK? And we're going to vary the cross-sectional scale. So here, uh, in, in these cases here, I've got sort of rectangular square scale. So we're going to make, we have a persistence length, the length of the edges in our polygonal chains. And we're going to vary the, the geome geometry of the tube cross-section in terms of that length scale. Okay, so we'll start from very skinny ones to ones that are basically infinite. Uh, we're going to vary the cell length. So that has to do with sort of the density, how much stuff we um, pack into a single cell that we then translate to create our periodic system. So that's a, a question of varying density. And then uh, alignment control. So, uh, we could have no alignment, and that would be a totally random system, let's say, 
Or we could imagine that there are some natural phenomena occurring that tends to make uh, the direction, these are somewhat oriented if you wish, um, moving in a way parallel to your axis. So we're going to um, look at entanglement or linking. In particular, we measure uh, our entanglement in terms of linking um, with these kinds of ver things varying. All right. So let's see. Did I advance that cell or not? I can't tell. Try it this way. Yes. OK, so the objective is to understand then the degree of entanglement of these filaments, either rings or arcs, filaments closed or open, in terms of the cross-sectional scale, uh, the density, and this alignment control. And I forgot when I'm supposed to stop, but I'm going to talk very slowly so that I use up all the available time. <laughs> because I only have two or three observations to share with you. It's like teaching a calculus class. If you tell them more than two or three things, it's hopeless. So I like to use that uh, motto. Uh, let's see here. Well, I don't know where to point this. Oh, there we go. OK, let's go back. Right, so um, linking. Um, so I, I've, I like to use the Gauss linking definition for linking numbers. And that's because uh, of an observation that's occurred to many of us over many years. Namely, it doesn't depend. All you need to have are two oriented filaments in space. They don't need to be closed rings. You need to learn to be happy with real numbers as being a linking number. And this has the wonderful property that they depend, whoops, shoot, hit the wrong button, continuously on the data, namely the, the filaments. You move the filaments a little, the linking numbers move a little, and so on. So that's a very um, uh, useful uh, formula. In fact, there is a for polygonal art filaments, there is a closed form that's very rapidly calculated. The periodic linking number is then to say, take one of those filaments, and then calculate how it links with all the other with the translates of all the others. Well, the point is our filaments are always compact. And since they're compact, then the other filament eventually is going to translate so far into the distance that its contribution should be irrelevant. And Eleni, in her doctoral dissertation, proved that that's exactly right, whether you're in one, two, or three dimensions, that this periodic linking number is actually well-defined. It converges and satisfies this. Um, it's symmetric and so on. Turns out to be a really, really challenging problem. Uh, and that was really the uh, one of the, that's the major accomplishment, I think, of, one, of that part of her doctoral dissertation is the fact that these things that seem obvious, in fact, actually are well defined. So we're going to use the periodic linking number of the linking between two, uh, two chains. But we also want the self-linking number. And the self-linking number is similarly defined in terms of a Gaussian writhe term and a torsion term. Uh, and also, those are well defined in a periodic system. If you take a chain, let's call it filament L, you take the self-linking number of one of its component constituent pieces and add the linking number of itself with all translates of it other than itself. Okay, And so then you have a periodic self-linking number, and it satisfies all those uh, wonderful properties. Um, 
Okay. So we have self-linking numbers and we have linking numbers. Now what? We've got a, a gel. We've got a system with a periodic system in which we've got some finite number of filaments generating the entire system. So we want to, we want to quantify the entanglement of the system, or if you wish, the linking present in the system. And so what we do is we create then the um, sort of linking matrix. And so our linking matrix is just the matrix of those terms. Okay? So that's a matrix that, that encapsulates then all of the entanglement present in the system. And it's, so it's the derived quantities of this linking matrix that we're going to um, focus on eventually. Well, not exactly. But that's going to, that play, this plays a principal component in this. Um, and I'll explain how. Right. What is next? Hmm. I don't know. There it is. Ah, okay. So just a quick reminder um, about, a quick reminder, maybe you weren't aware of this. Um, so some simple observations. That is, if you start with a, a system where you have basically a cell with a, a single uh, chain in it, then um, you start, so you can get the sort of linking matrix. If you glue M of these cells together, as we did here with two, see here, if I look at the periodic system, I'd say, well, it's going to be generated by a single chain because this piece gets matched up with that piece and I've got one ring. Here, I've got two rings. I've got this one that's intact. If I imagine now this whole thing here is going to be my basic cell, I've got two. I've got this one, then this one, and this one, and so on. So if I put together M cells into a single cell, gluing these M copies together, then the linking matrix that I get from such a system is a symmetric, centrosymmetric matrix. Now, uh, I imagine, oh, there is chalk here, okay. That you all know what a symmetric matrix is but you may not recall what a central symmetric matrix is. So a central symmetric matrix basically has a center, so it has an entry in the center, which means it has odd dimension. And it's symmetric around the center. So this is the same as that. This is the same as that, and so on. Okay. So it's symmetric around the center. I'm sure you can't read that, it's too small. But uh, such matrices have absolutely, um, have some very curious properties that one can exploit uh, and have, comp have um, consequences for things like eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So I'm not going to go into that, just point that particular um, uh, surprising feature out to you. There we go. Uh, so in fact now, what we do is we often will, we will take um, larger and larger blocks, and this is uh, in the hope of understanding what happens asymptotically to the entanglement as we increase the scale of our, of our cell size. And basically what we see here is encapsulated in the fact that the linking matrix for the first part um, is a separate block in there which tells me then 
that the eigenvalues, or the linking that's entangled, that's encapsulated just in that first cell, persists to infinity. So it's a stable part of that. And the rest becomes rather more complicated and is hidden away down in this F. But the, the, the single cell linking that you get um, persists as you sort of increase the scale of your system. So that's a curious uh, feature that uh, you might be able to see here later on. Now. Okay, so Olympic systems. Um, so one, the, the, there's a, a sort of simple point here that I wanted to, to make. The, namely, with Olympic systems, when things are, very, well, are not very dense, there's no linking. Okay, and then as you make them more dense, at a certain point, suddenly everything is linked together. This point uh, is about, if I remember right, 0 0.08. So right in here is where you go from no linking to total linking. And then the sort of, the sort of amount or the calculation of the, of the amount of linking present, then it's quite stable thereafter. Where this phenomena is important, and here's another way of, of expressing that, is in the area of percolation. And I can't recall if you guys use that term or not, but that's a, a sort of like a universal kind of phenomena that arises in the study of percolation or of such systems. Okay? So, um, So that, um, and what I'm imagining, the, the, so since it's one dimensional, my matrix, uh, let me see here, linking of two chains, right. So I just have a two by two sort of uh, 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 system here that we're, me we're measuring the linking between that's present in the system. Okay, so this is sort of observed point um, in the one-dimensional system then is sort of like zero, and then uh, you get, you can't see it, but this is the first place where you get a non-zero value, and then as you look across the entire population of, po of, po of such systems, you see the probability of linking keeps increasing um, as the function of the density. Now, not all that interesting or surprising, and if this were the whole story uh, with you, I wouldn't really bother sharing you, this with you. But uh, in fact, with Spencer, Ingram, and Eleni, we went to look at two-dimensional systems. So now, uh, rather than one p periodic boundary condition, now we have a laminar kind of system. Uh, which is much like, which is really like what Arsuaga and Diao and others have been looking at related to the biological system in the mitochondria. Uh, it's a two-dimensional system. And so we did our analysis and our linking matrix in the two-dimensional system, and we discovered as we look at the, the eigenvalues of our matrix that in fact, uh, you can d detect, before you get a, a two-dimensional saturation, you get a one-dimensional saturation. That is to say, you look at the matrix, and you look at its eigenvalues, and you get a first non-zero eigenvalue. So the eigenvector then gives you a direction in which the, the, the um, rings in that these are all unknotted and small unknotted rings. They're very much like, like circles that are bent and twisted a little bit. So they're not doing random stuff so much. But they, in some dimension, they start hooking up. And so there will be a one-dimensional 
uh, linked, infinitely linked system, parallel another one, another one, and another one. So you see a one-dimensional kind of filamental linking system that occurs and dominates up until another point when a second eigenvalue comes into play and then uh, creates a two-dimensional saturated system. Okay? So you can see um, an evolution in the underlying structure of the, saturate, of the um, entangled system. In one case, it starts looking just like parallel lines in some direction, it's parallel strands of things linked, and then it becomes a big, like a, a, um, like a blanket, okay? Well, of course, <coughs> having seen that in um, two dimensions, we ask, okay, what happens in three? And by golly, uh, the same sort of phenomena happens in three. Um, let me go back. I can. So the at zero point zero eight is when you first get the the you, when you get the first infinitely entangled subsystem, and so in some vocabulary that's percolation. That's the point where this universal percolation occurs, but. What we're saying is that it's a little, one can look at this and, and see a more subtle picture, if you wish, but where there's a first um, sort of infinite system and where uh, is one dimensional, and then later you start getting this two dimensional system kicking in, and then similarly in three dimensions. So, um, so there is, uh, I think, a very um, powerful um, utilization of um, the periodic linking matrix analysis and the associated eigenvalues to try to <coughs> characterize, capture the, character, the, capture the character or the nature of the entanglement present in this system in a way that's maybe not uh, accessible from other perspectives at least to my knowledge. So um, that's one idea. Good. So I have another 20 minutes or something for a second idea. Um, and so here's just another graph of, again, uh, valence. Right, what do I mean by valence? Uh, it's the number, if you take one of these rings, it's the number of other rings that are linked with it. So valence zero um, means no linking at all. And here is this, this universal point that I mentioned, 0 0.08 density, where you start, uh, where you get um, the linking of two rings and that persists for a while, and then you start getting higher and higher density. By the way, these numbers, of course, are not, you know, the variation goes from 0 0.08 to, to 1 um, in terms of the density. But you see this linking goes up, uh, you know, quite, uh, it's how to say, re not regular, but bounded fashion, okay? Um, controlled, again, by the... Um, the character of the, the size of these rings. <coughs> okay, so second theme. Right, so this was stimulated then by papers of, I'm reading this work of Renzo on sort of fluid flow and entanglement and fluid flow and helicity and the relationship that Eleni and I have been interested in between helicity and linking and entanglement is measured by this sort of periodic linking. And so <coughs> um, I'm going to focus our attention on filaments of single chain or filaments of length 25 Okay, so these are open. Uh, they're going to 
occur in a tube uh, of, of um, not unit radius. In these pictures, it's units, unit radius, but these are really round tubes. I just haven't drawn in the circles <coughs> of some um, radius, and here the radius is one. And then we have this alignment constraint. When I, when I have zero, it means no constraint at all, so it's totally random. So this is like a random walk, unit step size, confined to a tube of radius one. Okay, uh, And then we take one of those. Well, you see multiple colors there. I, yeah, they're all the same. So this is multiple colors represent different translations. Uh, and then if I... Um, invoke and this alignment constraint, which scales from zero to being totally random to one being a straight rod, so total constraint. Okay, if my constraint is 0.5, then this is what you will see, and so you'll see different slopes, and sometimes you'll see it can come, it can go back a little bit, and so on. So we're going to look at Again, an analysis of the entanglement uh, that we see under the variation of both the tube size and the alignment constraint. Okay. So, um, just to give some sort of geometric sense of this, uh, one of the things we should look at is the radius of gyration, and the other is the diameter. And I should say what I mean by diameter. Um, if you have a, a, a chain, by diameter I mean the largest distance between two vertices in the chain. <coughs> okay, so it's like a graph, <coughs> diameter of the graph. Okay, so um, let's look at this. When the alignment is like close to one, then uh, it's pretty close to straight, and so the diameter is basically 25. Okay, so it's sort of basically stretched out. When the alignment is zero, then uh, the diameter is well, maybe less than maybe about eight or so. Um, and as I increase the radius of my tube, so this is when the tube is really, really tight. So this is probably like the diameter that you would expect to get if you were doing a random walk on a line of step 25. As the radius gets larger, so this is now five, so the radius is five, so the sort of diameter is like 10, then you're sort of approaching a random walk in three space. And so you'd expect to see a diameter that's as close to the expected number there, okay? And then as you vary the alignment, of course, you should see differing um, diameters. One feature of this, as you'll see, is it's quite stable. Um, the, the dependence on the radius of the tube is really quite sensitive. <coughs> Here, notice that the radius of gyration of the random one is the smallest. And of course, the radius of a gyration of the aligned one is the largest because it's stretched out as far as it possibly can be. So the order sort of changes, okay? Well, um, does this make sense? And so here is, are some pictures then of length 25 chains um, with alignment constraint at 0 0.25, but where I vary the radius from a quarter up to one. And so here, the pictures aren't really to scale. Otherwise, I'd never get them on a the screen. But you can see that as the, the radial confinement, um, in, how to say it, de diminishes, or which if the radius gets larger and larger, then the character of these filaments evolves uh, sort of closer and closer to the sort of free space uh, kind of behavior. Similarly, um, here I vary the, so the 
radius is a quarter and the alignment scale is from random to about 0.75. Uh, again, the scale, the scale is not the same because we know um, here, this is going to be, to be relatively confined, right? Because it's random. Uh, and as I increase the, um, the alignment, then they stretch. So here, uh, this tube is probably at length about 25. And so to get it on the same scale, that's what we had to do. So this is, there's a little back and forth motion in there, but it's mostly linear, okay? So, um, all of this seems quite banal, actually. Uh, no surprises. Uh, so why would I bother telling you about this? So there's the pictures that we um, had. And our, our question is, OK, what, this, what is the um, consequence of this for the entanglement of a system then um, subject to these constraints? So, okay, absolute self-linking. So remember we, we described the periodic self-linking. Um, we take the absolute value of the self-linking because we're gonna do an average. And if we do the average just because of um, uh, the fact that we could do mirror symmetries, the average would always be zero. So we take the absolute value of the self-linking um, and see how that depends on the, um, these parameters. So once again, I see not a huge amount of variation as I change the radius of my tube, which uh, we find somewhat curious. Uh, also somewhat curious is that when I look at random configurations, I get the smallest self-linking. Whereas the largest self-linking comes with the largest alignment force. So these things are getting stretched out and yet and and have and and, and have the largest self-linking. Okay, granted, we're going from 1.1 to 1.6, so it's not like an earth-shattering amount of change, but it's really quite persistent evolution from uh, a random self-linking, which is a, maybe a baseline, uh, but as it stretches out, the self-linking increases. So um, this, I would propose to you, is a little curious. Um, at least it wasn't what I had expected. And um, so it caused me to, well, actually what it caused me to think is we'd screwed up somehow, that this couldn't possibly be right. And so we spent some time checking things and then trying to figure out why. And so what I'd like to share with you this morning is, well, why is this the case? Ooh, OK. So it's the torsion that dominates. Okay. Here is the torsion for the um, <clears throat> the torsion for the random one, and here's the torsion for the alignment. And the aligned one has more torsion to it. Now recall, um, somebody a few days ago defined how to think of the torsion. You take three consecutive edges, the first two determine a plane, and then the last two determine a plane, and it's the angle between those planes. Well, is measured by the angle between their normals. But anyway, it's the angle between those two planes. So it tells you that as you're sort of going, you imagine your chain sort of going, your filament going in this direction, it's sort of going like this. Right, it's sort of doing, uh, and we keep track of the sign, by the way. Uh, it measures the amount of twisting uh, present in the chain. The other con contributing factor, right, to the self-linking 
is the Gaussian uh, writhe coming from the curvature. Oops, wrong thing. There we go. And notice that, uh, as one expects, that term is very, very tiny for things that are aligned and isn't all that large for things that are random. So, in fact, what's happening is that the um, torsion is what's dominating the self-linking. So the torsion's dominating the self-linking. And so why is that? Um, and the, our answer is, um, well, it's due to the fact that when, uh, so I, this is going to happen with the linking too. So it's going to be the same answer that the stretched out ones link with, or if you wish, entangle with longer segments of the other filaments. When you're compact and you're sort of random, you're only, you're only entangled with those that are right in your immediate neighborhood, okay? The ones that you have contact with. But as you stretch out, you have contact with more. And so on the net, then, you get the entanglement increases with alignment and persists with alignment because you are in fact interacting with more filaments. And so it would seem then that a more aligned system would be more powerfully entangled than a random system for that reason. Okay. Boy. So, Let's see what happens, and here it is, then. It's exactly what happens with the eigenvalues, right? You'll see that the smallest eigenvalue comes from the um, random system, and the largest is from the more aligned system, and then the variation between. And it varies, you know, not a great spectrum here, but a significant spectrum. So this is the largest eigenvalue in, we're looking at a three chain system, three independent filaments of length 25. Boy. So somehow, okay, I wonder, uh, do I have another option? Oh, I did, uh, second. Largest, right. So the second largest really drops down quite a bit, um, and but a similar relationship. And the third one, uh, even smaller, but still an important three eigenvalues, and they're really quite bunched together. So if we look at just uh, a sort of, you know, the random ones, we can see that the same sort of um, separation between the smallest and the, and the, and the largest eigenvalue um, gives you a, a, a sort of spectrum of the quality of the entanglement or of the linking that's present in the, present in the system. Um, here's what happens. That was a random case. Mm. Boy, right. So this is the random case, right? Alignment is at zero, zero. What happens when I stretch it out? Boy. There we go. Everything shifts up a bit. And even more when I get really closer, right? So so sort of contrary, at least to my intuition, um, I'm expecting um, largest entanglement, if you wish, for aligned systems, sort of fibrous systems. Okay, so now someplace, 
here. Just another slide that shows you this kind of how, how they relate when I change the tube radius, the stability there. And so basically what I wanted to show you, share with you, is how Eleni Panagiotou's periodic linking matrix can be used to study both Olympic systems and tease out from that the evolution of the sort of nature of, if you wish, uh, entanglement in one, two, and three dimensional systems, and also how this bears, gives one an ability to study the sort of entanglement in a one dimensional periodic uh, boundary system of filaments. And Right, so those are the folks. I start, we started working, of course, some time ago with Doris Theodoro and Christos Zumanakis. Uh, Spencer is now off to graduate school. Uh, and then, of course, Laney is back in Santa Barbara um, <coughs> teaching. I'm having trouble with this. So anyway, thank you for your attention. Um, so, 